Good evening. Thank you for filling up the room so quickly so we can get right to the program on time. Uh, I'm Harold Holzer. I have the honor of serving as director of Roosevelt House. And, uh, and that's Michael Myers, who is hired to lead the applause every, every week. Um, what a pleasure it is to welcome Terry Galway back to Roosevelt House. He was last here to discuss his book, Frank and Al, about guess who? Franklin Roosevelt and Al Smith. He's also written about Tammany Hall and the creation of modern American politics. And now he's back at FDR's home to talk about another unforgettably colorful and accomplished New York uh, historical figure and the antithesis of Tammany Hall, I guess. <laughs> yes. The Little Flower, Fiorello LaGuardia. Uh, a brief, bold, uh, deeply researched and highly readable book. Uh, to remind you, we will have a conversation here. You will have an opportunity to ask some questions and then we're going to invite you all upstairs to a reception in Terry's honor at which you'll have the op something like the opportunity or the obligation to, to buy this book that's going to be easy to carry home, right? It's a, I should have brought my copy down to show you, but easy to carry home and worth, and worth the read. So in addition to his books on political history, Terry has been a senior editor at Politico. He was a columnist and editor of the late lamented New York Observer. Uh, a member of the Times editorial board and a columnist for the Irish Echo. He's taught at NYU, nobody's perfect, and <laughs> the College of Staten Island. So let's start with a story. I'm going to tell a little story and then ask you about it because I don't have an ending to the story. Um, I know you'll be able to provide some comment. I'll make it up if I have to. Right. right. So an outgoing mayor... Um, who I won't name, once told me at a huge reception that was staged to honor him on his way out of the mayoralty, um, he was in a very festive mood, let's say. Mm -hmm. He came up to me and he said, what the hell is it about LaGuardia anyway? <laughs> and I'm, I'm cleaning up the way he actually said it. He said, why is he the greatest mayor, dot, 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 why am I not the greatest mayor? I said, oh, you are the greatest mayor. But <laughs> So <laughs> what is it about LaGuardia? The performance, the, the, the myth, the reputation, the, the, the radio, what is it about LaGuardia that, he ha that has produced this mythical reputation for 90 years that he was the greatest mayor New York has ever had? It's all of those things, isn't it? Uh, first of all, he was, first of all, thanks to all of you for coming out. Thanks to Harold for being a wonderful host, as always. Uh, and, uh, and thank you all for your interest in reading. It's, I'm a teacher at the College of Staten Island, and I'm a parent of some 20-somethings, and reading is becoming a bit of a cult, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, thank you for that, and, and thank you for your interest in Franklin Roosevelt, one of the great heroes of American history, and another one, Fiorello. So why, yeah, what is it about Fiorello? Well, first of all, he was a wonderful personality. And I would tell you, you know, if there were another mayor that I covered in my lifetime who was like Fiorello in terms of, just in terms of this bullion character, it would be Ed Koch, right? Koch loved being mayor, right, and letting you know. But uh, you know, a couple of things that sort of were maybe a little different. First of all, uh, unlike Mayor Koch, Mayor LaGuardia made it through three terms without any scandals, right? I mean, I'm not, and I'm not casting any aspersions on, on Mayor Koch, but LaGuardia ran this city for 12 years without the hint of a scandal. That tells you about the kinds of people he drew to New York politics, who also kept his reputation alive, right? LaGuardia made some really good enemies, but he also made some really good friends. And they were the ones who made sure that people never forgot the little flower, right? There was that. There was his colorful personality, right? People, you know, my grandparents told me, oh, yes, we remember seeing Fiorello LaGuardia in a sidecar, you know, a police sidecar running to a, 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 fi a fire, right? 
uh, I wrote a history of the New York City Fire Department, which had a picture of LaGuardia in a turnout coat, you know, which the fire department with, the, you know, the rubber coats, right? He's emerging from a house fire, right, an apartment fire. And I have to tell you, I am fairly certain that the chief on the site or the captain on the site was saying, oh, my God, the mayor is here. What are we going to do with it? What, put him over there and just tell him to put something out, right? <laughs> so there's that. And, and, of course, his mythical reading of the comics, which, as I learned, only happened three times, right? <laughs> I, I thought he did it the whole time. No, he did it three times during newspaper during strike. During strike, right? Yeah, yeah, in July of 1945, when he was already he said he wasn't going to run for fourth term, which was probably the smartest thing he ever did. Fourth terms don't work out so well. Uh, I mean, third terms, actually, generally. So it's all of those things. It's personality, his integrity, his honesty, um, and, you know, the fact that, you know, the, the fact that um, he seemed to be able to relate to ordinary New Yorkers in ways that I don't think we've seen the likes of that ever since. So in a period when we, we, we talk so much about immigration, tell us about LaGuardia's roots and a little bit about his education. Sure. Well, I mean, LaGuardia's uh, parents were Italian immigrants. They came through Ellis Island. Uh, or, um, no, I'm sorry. They didn't come through Ellis Island, right? They came through Castle Garden, right? Yeah. Ellis Island wasn't open until 90. 1891, 1892. So they came through Castle Garden. He worked at Ellis Island. That was what I meant to say. Uh, but he was certainly proud of his Italian roots, but he never played the Italian card per se. Like he never, uh, I don't think he ever sort of pandered to Italian Americans. He was the first Italian American uh, who represented uh, any place in, in the Congress. He was the first Italian American congressman. Uh, and he, had, he certainly had a special place in his heart for immigrants, but most of his biographers, who are, who are far more versed in this than I, you know, Thomas Kessner, you know, <laughs> wrote an 800-page biography of LaGuardia and, and, you know, spent years researching his life, so I trust him more than I trust me. Uh, and, you know, he said it wasn't that LaGuardia felt I, uh, this, uh, this uh, empathy for immigrants because of his family background. It was because he felt it was the right thing to do. And uh, he, you know, LaGuardia was fluent in five languages, and it was said that he could curse you out in any one of the five, or all five. Including Yiddish, right? Including Yiddish, right. And Italian, and uh, Serbo-Croatian, and German, and English, or some version of English. And he got a job as a translator on Ellis Island for a couple of years. So he literally was the voice of these migrants telling their stories to the inspectors at Ellis Island. He was their voice. And I think he, th that experience educated him. So when, 100 years ago, this at this very moment, 100 years ago, Congress was debating the National Origins Act, the Immigration Reform of 1924, which basically said, let's stop immigration from Southern Europe and from Eastern Europe, right. Italians and Jews, uh, and, and further limit immigration from Asia. When he stood in his full five foot two majesty, and on the floor of the house, he was speaking for those people, you know, and, and he, he had this tremendous self, sense of self-righteousness about immigration, and, and called out the bigots for who they were right. in ways that were remarkable. And that beautifully demonstrated in your book, I might add, the, the section about speaking out against a lonely voice, because he didn't yes. sway enough votes. No. Not that it was his responsibility. but So um, w w one, one question I hadn't intended to ask, what's a nice Irish boy like you <laughs> doing writing about Fiorello LaGuardia? <laughs> How did you come to the subject? Well, I, I said once that you know most of the people I write about are named O'Shaughnessy and uh, Kelly, but I thought I would change things up for a change. I would write about somebody who was even shorter than me. Uh, but uh, frankly, it was my editor's idea. M my editor, uh, Elizabeth Disregard at uh, St. Martin's, had said, look, you know, you've written about, you've written the ultimate defense of Tammany Hall, so obviously you're the person to write about the person who brought Tammany Hall down. But she thought that I could, whether I did or not, it's up to you, but she thought I could capture LaGuardia's uh, personality and his career. And I'll be honest, Elizabeth loves Fiorella LaGuardia, and she had said, all her life as an editor, she wanted to find somebody who could write a book about Fiorello LaGuardia and bring him back to the public consciousness, and she chose me. By the way, not, not to be self-serving, but who expanded Castle Garden to bring in more people? Lincoln. Just thought you should know that. 
Yeah, do, do we know anybody who's ever written anything about Lincoln? Like, why would so, you do that? So why did, why did Fiorello turn to uh, politics? What brought him in? Was it power? Was it <laughs> reformer's instinct? Was it both? Well, the fir first of all, he would really hate the fact that you phrased the question that way. Because the title of my book is called, I Never Did Like Politics. That's why I'm asking you. Right. And, and, they come, and I'll answer your question in a sort of longish way. But the, the phrase comes from uh, the 1940s. LaGuardia was in the middle of his third term. World War II is on, right? Frankly, he's bored with his job. If you look at his correspondence <laughs> at the time, he's clearly bored, and he's just itching to get where the action is. So he's, he is lobbying Franklin Roosevelt and Secretary of War Henry Stinson for a job as a brigadier general. Right? Now, he had been a major in World War I. He had volunteered for the Air Service and apparently was the worst pilot in all of <laughs> the Air Force's history. But he felt that that qualified him to go into service again. And it, by the way, this is LaGuardia the Patriot, right? They, I mean, he absolutely b wants to do something for his country. Uh, and, he, and he makes it clear. He tells Roosevelt, I want a job in uniform. I don't want to be a civilian administrator. So he's lobbying for the job. He writes a letter to Secretary of War Henry Stinson, and he's explaining why he wants to go into the Army again. And he says, I never did like politics. And I have to say, when I read that passage, when I read that letter, my first reaction was, dude, nobody made you run for mayor three times. Come on. Right? What do you mean he didn't like politics? He loved politics. He didn't like politicians. But what made him... I think it was ambition. When his family moved back to Italy uh, in around uh, 1898, about 1900, and uh, so they're back in Italy, and his father dies, um, and he tells his mother that he's going to back, back to New York because, he says, I want to be somebody. And, you know, all right, well, that sort of tells you something right there. And uh, once he came back to New York, he fell in with a lot of Italian-American activists and they sort of said, you know, he could be the one, right? In the same way that Charlie Murphy looked at Al Smith and said, okay, he could be the one that could bring Tammany Hall to respectability. I think these Italian-American activists looked at Fiorello, looked at his personality, looked at his, his intelligence and said, okay, this could be the guy. And they propped him up. Uh, and, you know, he shocked everybody by winning a race for Congress in 1916 against an Irish guy, a as Tammany a guy. As a Republican. As a Republican, right, I should have added that. As a, no one thought any Republican was gonna, I think it was the 14th Congressional District, but it was the old Greenwich Village District. Uh, he was running against an Italian, uh, uh, rather an Irish American uh, who had won in 1914, and in 1916, LaGuardia, and he was a saloon keeper, as many Tammany people were, right? They, they were. Uh, and uh, so LaGuardia showing, he once said, I can, out, uh, I can out demagogue anybody. That was LaGuardia on himself. Confronts this, Italian, uh, this Irish incumbent and says of him, not only is he pro-British, he's a bad bartender. <laughs> and I have to say, I'm not sure which was the most effective insult. <laughs> but he, how did he decide to become a Republican? What, what was that? I think origin he, story. I think he hated Tammany. Hated so Tammany. He hated Tammany. His story is, you know, one of the but other. But Koch things. hated Tammany. I mean, you well, drew that's an true illusion that he, you know, he defeated DiSapio from within. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Right. So that that's a contrast with Koch. Um, I think that uh, you know Tammany wasn't good. With, Tammany wasn't good about recruiting Italian Americans, and and the reason for it was simply that a lot of Italians, like the LaGuardias, went back. A lot of young single Italian men were true migrants. They went back and forth, and so they didn't register. So, you know, Tammany's con Tammany, the way Tammany looked at it was, the Jews were coming in and registering to vote. We will foster that relationship. The Italians are not registering. Some of them are not. They're here for six months. They're back in Italy for six months. They're not voting. We're not that interested in recruiting them. So LaGuardia had no mentor who would say, please, come, come here. We, we'd, love to re we'd love to recruit you so we could get some Italians voting for us. So the Republicans were the obvious uh, the choice. But the other thing I didn't know about LaGuardia is he spent his formative years not in New York, but in Prescott, Arizona, because his father was in the military, and he was an army brat. 
But he, he, in his autobiography, he describes being in Prescott. He, he said it was the happiest time of his life. But he also he comes of age as a teenager, and he's reading the New York newspapers, which come to Prescott about a week later. And it was during the Boss Croker years of Tammany, Grift. And he, that was when he decided, OK, those people are bad. And if I ever get the chance, I'm going to kick their butt, which he did. Right. So two Koch-related questions. You can dispose of them quickly. OK. Did LaGuardia ever go around saying, how am I doing? <laughs> Or was he, <laughs> was he uber secure? <laughs> oh, I think he was uber secure. He was pretty sure he was doing OK. He didn't have to ask. I mean, I think Koch did too, but he asked. Yes, I think so. It was part of the shtick. It was, yeah. the, it was the shtick. Yeah. Relationships with governors. Koch Cuomo, not good. Beam Carey, not good. de Blasio Cuomo, not good. Uh -huh. how, about, how about LaGuardia and the governors? Of New York, well, for the opposite most, party. Right? Yes, you're, for the most part, we're talking about Herbert Lehman, and they had a decent working relationship, which you know I always kind of thought that Koch and Cuomo figured it out, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. Oh, you would know better than I. I don't think so. No. No. Okay. I'm I could naive. tell. I could tell you stories. I have a feeling. <laughs> Once the wine starts <laughs> flowing upstairs, let me tell you. But uh, but uh, Lehman and Laguardia were both New Dealers, right? So they, they and they were both you know friendly with. Friends. Roosevelt's handpicked successor as governor, and LaGuardia manages to become not just America's mayor, but particularly Roosevelt's mayor. Yeah. So they had a, a they had a, a good sense of shared priorities. But when it came to things like city-state relations, I think they fought as much as you would expect any mayor of New York and any governor of New York were going to yeah. fight. You know, well, it's when, from the money. Well, from it's the money. about the money. But yeah, LaGuardia had much more home rule autonomy than mayors have had since Yes, being, that's a good point. Because there yes. was not a fiscal control board that had wrested control of municipal affairs. That's so, very, that's a good uh, point. Yeah, but again, it was all about the money and, yeah. the, and the state budget, whatever that is, wherever that is. Right. Um, what, one other Lehman connection too, by the way, so after LaGuardia leaves the mayoralty in 1945, he's appointed to the United Nations Refugee Administration, which when we say United Nations, it actually was a reference to what the allies were called. The United Nations didn't exist yet, right. but, but the allies were often called the United Nations. So he, uh, he gets the job, Harry Truman appoints him to that job as the head of the refugee uh, administration. His predecessor was Herbert Lehman. So I guess it was a New York patronage job. Yeah. Um, so it's one thing to win a congressional seat as a Republican in the village, um, as the an Italian hero, right? Italian-American hero. But it's extraordinary that he won the mayoralty, right? Yes. Right? Yes, well... I mean, we've had two Republicans win the mayoralty in recent years, but it, it, at that That's point, an anomaly. Yeah. yeah. He was an anomaly. So how did he put together that fusion? And he was, I guess, described himself as a fusion candidate, Yes, right? he certainly did, right. Yeah, yeah, in fact, you know, lots of, lots of his Republican colleagues had no time for him either. Right, because in part because he really didn't give out patronage. I mean, I remember when Koch was mayor, and I was a journalist. I remember Koch saying, "There's going to be no patronage in my administration," and we all sort of said, "Okay, all right, yeah." <laughs> but in LaGuardia's case, it probably was true, and that's why the Republicans didn't like him. But they they had a winner. Yeah. But to answer your question, and it is appropriate that I would tell the story in, in Roosevelt House. So in 1933, uh, New York is being governed by this Tammany hack named O'Brien who is clearly in over his head. I would say the same thing about Fiorello, but could that be a reference to? But, <laughs> but I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't. Uh, but uh, O'Brien is a hack, appointed there by Tammany. You know, Jimmy Walker had resigned in disgrace in 1931. An acting mayor had taken his place, a guy called McKee from the Bronx. He was very capable, but Tammany arranged a special election. They get their guy, O'Brien. All you need to know about Mayor O'Brien is that when he becomes mayor, the press descends upon him and says to Mayor O'Brien, Mayor, who is going to be your police commissioner? To which he responds, I don't know. They haven't told me yet. <laughs> so what more did you need? So O'Brien is now running in 1933. And like even I think even Tammany knew, oh my god, like what are we going to do? LaGuardia, this is his third attempt to be mayor now. He ran for the Republican nomination in 1920 and was rejected. He, ran, he took a bullet for the Republican Party in 1929 by running against Jimmy Walker. Did well, 
did well for a Republican, but now he's running a third time. So it's O'Brien versus LaGuardia, and it really is going to be an interesting race until it got even more interesting when Ed Flynn, who is Franklin Roosevelt's guy in the Bronx, and Jim Farley, who is Roosevelt's postmaster general and chairman of the Democratic National Committee, come up with a third candidate under the guise of the Recovery Party. And the third candidate is McKee from the Bronx. And this is all being done with Roosevelt's knowledge. And Flynn, Flynn in his memoir, he's the only sort of political boss I know that actually wrote a memoir, because usually they don't write things down, sometimes because they don't know how, right? <laughs> but, but he wrote a memoir in which his disappointment is clear. Like, he thought Franklin Roosevelt was going to endorse their guy, McKee, on the recovery party, and that would win the race, right? Well, Roosevelt, that sly devil, never actually endorses McKee, and... LaGuardia wins the mayoralty with a split Democratic ticket. He wins with 40% of the vote. So that's how he won, with a split. Now, would he have beaten McKee straight up? Uh, rather, would he have beaten O'Brien straight up? Who knows? It's fascinating. But he won re-election. Oh, his re-elections were quite easy, yes. Yeah. And so tell us some highlights of his, of his administration, some successes. I mean, I know that he got a lion's share of WPA money and Public Works Administration money from the Roosevelt administration and all of these swimming pool projects and oh God, uh, yes. other projects were, you know, accrued to LaGuardia's credit as much as Roosevelt's. Right. Well, I mean, it, frankly, if, if it weren't for the WPA and other uh, Roosevelt money, Maybe we wouldn't even be talking about Fiorello LaGuardia. We would be, but we'd be talking admirably about the reform administration that he had. But there was money to be had in Washington through the WPA. Uh, I forget uh, the author of the book I'm about to cite, but there was a book about the WPA which said that one out of every seven WPA dollars was spent in New York City. And the biggest WPA project for a time, was the airport that we now know as LaGuardia yeah. Airport, right? <laughs> Although the Tribor Bridge wasn't bad. The Tribor Bridge is pretty good. The FDR Drive yeah, wasn't yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. And the name for FDR, so they yeah, traded. well, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. branding. But, uh, but it, what, two things I would talk about. One is, uh, which is a bad word these days, but NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority, which I know is in bad form these days, but LaGuardia started it. He was a pioneer in the idea of public housing, right? He had no sympathy for landlords, I should say, and, uh, and, and having lived, you know, it's often described by the other LaGuardia scholars that he lived in a tenement in, the East, Har in East Harlem. It's true he lived in East Harlem. In fact, he had to almost be forced to move into Gracie Mansion in 1941. I'm not sure it was a tenement like the Tenement Museum is. I think it was maybe a little bit sort of upper class tenement, but he lived in a tenement building in East Harlem. He knew what the conditions were like. His one of his great tragedies, which he never spoke about, his first wife and baby daughter died within months of each other. The daughter of tuberculosis, of, of spinal meningitis, and his 26-year-old wife of tuberculosis. And he always blamed it for, uh, on, on living conditions. They were living in the village at the time. So he, the only time he references it was when he talks about his housing policy. And he says, I never want anybody to, to go through what I went through with my wife and, and baby. Right? So he starts NYCHA. He, uh, the fir first houses on the Lower East Side is a LaGuardia project. He's trying to show the federal government that they can do housing. And then he persuades um, the Roosevelt administration to build the Williamsburg houses. Uh, and that sort of becomes the first time the federal government is ever involved in housing. So there's that. Uh, and, and many other housing projects get built, or housing developments get built under LaGuardia's rule, and some of it with WPA money. And through Robert Wagner, uh, the federal government in uh, the 40s becomes uh, a full partner in housing. Never happened before. Then LaGuardia Airport comes about as a result, partly. Uh, first of all, as I said, LaGuardia was a pilot himself, right? Uh, one day he was flying from Chicago, uh, where he was at the Conference of Bayers, and, you know, he, he's flying from Chicago, and they land in Newark, right? Because that's, that's what you do, right? You, you land in Newark, and then you take the ferry over to Manhattan. LaGuardia was in a particularly persnickety mood that night. And everybody gets off the plane, except this guy who is not getting off the plane. And the pilot comes back and says, uh, 
Major, because he preferred to be called Major, Major, you know, you have to leave. He says, I'm not leaving. My ticket says New York. You're flying me to New York. <laughs> and the guy, I mean, he does an Art Carney. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, Ralph Kiner, uh, Ralph Cramden. So uh, they bring in the head of the airport. The airport says, Major, Mayor, whatever you want to call yourself, like, you gotta leave. He says, I'm not leaving. I'm the mayor of New York. The ticket says New York. So arrangements are made for him to fly to Floyd Bennett Field, which the airlines didn't like using because it was too far from Manhattan. And I, I guess the runways maybe weren't, it, it was a small airport. And surprisingly enough, there were reporters there when LaGuardia touches down at Floyd Bennett Airport. <laughs> right? So it was, at that point, LaGuardia says, you know, he understands, you know, New York is New York because of innovation, the Erie Canal, right, and other things. New York is not going to allow, and I live in New Jersey these days, so I can say this, New York is not going to allow Newark to become the hub for this civil aviation uh, industry. So he persuades, it doesn't require much persuasion, but he persuades uh, Roosevelt to fund an airport. And he goes around New York looking for places that would be suitable. One of the places he liked was Governor's Island. And the War Department said, uh, really, no. Now, I do have to say, I think the War Department may have been onto something, because uh, flying a modern plane into Governor's Island these days, I'm not sure that would work tight, so well, yeah. yeah. So anyway, long story short, very long story short, he starts work on what was called North Field or something like that. And uh, LaGuardia Airport is built in something like two and a half years with WPA money. And of course, the city council, I guess it was a, with the Board of Aldermen back then? It was either the city council or the Board of Aldermen passed a resolution, and they were all Democrats. Uh, passed a resolution naming the airport after LaGuardia, and the mayor very graciously agreed to that, surprisingly. So you might know, but I, I hope the audience finds this interesting. When, um, when Roosevelt House was officially transferred to Hunter College, um, FDR was supposed to be here. But instead, he was on a secret ocean voyage to Tehran, I think for one of his conferences. conferences. Yeah. And Eleanor came to represent the family and present the deed to the president of Hunter College. By the way, be careful about Newark. Our incoming president is the chancellor of Hunter of uh, Rutgers Newark. Just oh, saying. that's right. right. Yes. So we love Newark now. <laughs> um, and lo and behold, LaGuardia shows up yeah. at this event, and he speaks for about 20 minutes about Hunter College. So that's our great Roosevelt House connection to, to Fiorello. And we always wonder why the transverse across Central Park was built so that the cars come right past FDR's home. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether that was FDR's parting shot at his mother. I don't know. <laughs> that we're going to have a lot of traffic here. So tell, tell, tell us a little bit about um, LaGuardia's second wife, whom I actually met, and I'll tell you about. Marie. Marie. Well, you know, Marie worked for Fiorello LaGuardia for years. It was one of his most devoted workers. Um, she was single uh, and, and apparently quite savvy politically as well. It sounds like he relied on her before they were married. He relied on her quite a bit for uh, political advice. She was tireless. And, you know, as these things go, Fiorello doesn't, you know, men back then didn't really write about their feelings, you know, like they do now. But uh, Fiorello didn't really write much about how he romanced his second wife, so we don't know a whole lot about it, except that they worked together. And they were married, I guess, in a civil ceremony, and they spent their honeymoon in the city council chambers, which, you know, <laughs> okay. Uh, it, tells you, it tells you a little bit about both. Marie, in her own right, was quite a public servant, too. Yeah. So I met her in 1977. She was decided to endorse Mario Cuomo, not Ed Koch, for mayor. Oh, dear. And she was, the event was, she was going to come and present Mario with one of LaGuardia's big black hats. Oh, Christ. And when I saw the hat, I said to Mario, whatever you do, don't put it on. <laughs> Do not put it on. And he said, oh, you think I'm going to look like a gangster. Is that it? I said, well, just looking at the hat, I don't think it's a great look. As soon as she offered him the hat, he put it on. The New York Post took a famous picture of him 
looking like a Don. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. And yeah. but she was very still with it yep. in seventy seven and very committed to, you know, the person she he, she perceived as kind of Fiorello come back oh, in a certain way. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 So what was the relationship? It, I think privately you said that upstairs you said LaGuardia was spent a lot of time in the White House sure did. once FDR took office, left this house in 1933. So tell us about those visits and how, how frequent they were. You know, uh, because of the magic of the internet, uh, the FDR library up in Hyde Park has this wonderful digital presence. And not all of the collections by any means are digitized, but a good portion of them are. Uh, but one of the things that is digitized is the White House log for every day. So I went through it. I mean, there are times when LaGuardia is coming in every two weeks, and you look at who's, who's ahead of him. General Marshall is in for a briefing about D-Day. Oh, and then Fiorello, I'm making that part up. But it was sort of like that. You know, he's seeing foreign dignitaries. He's seeing the chief of staff of the armed services. And then he's seeing the mayor of New York. So that tells me he regarded his partnership with LaGuardia as really important and very personal also. Uh, there is a point in the, uh, before the United States was in the war, uh, where LaGuardia, throughout the, another facet of LaGuardia's uh, life, which is important, is that he was condemning Adolf Hitler from the moment Adolf Hitler took office, right? And to the point where the German government was filing complaints with Washington about Fira LaGuardia. And after, and after one incident, after one incident, the, the State Department actually issued an apology to Berlin because LaGuardia had referred to Hitler as a brown-shirted fanatic which actually is kind of mild. <laughs> now, maybe he called him something else in German, and we don't know, but, uh, but at one point, you know, and Roosevelt was in on the, the phrasing, like, how are we going to phrase this? I mean, you've been on those meetings, right? How are we going to phrase this to, uh, to appease the Berlin but not seem like we're kissing up to Hitler? And you know, Roosevelt is not really happy about doing this, so the next I think it's several days later, LaGuardia comes to the Oval Office for one of his regular uh, routine messages, and Roosevelt greets LaGuardia by saying, Heil Fiorello, <laughs> to which Fiorello says, Heil Franklin, and then they got on to their business, right? So they had that kind of relationship where they should, could kid each other. But let me tell you, uh, it was Rabbi Stephen Wise said, there was one voice in America raised about Hitler, and it was Fiorello LaGuardia. Was, was LaGuardia ever suspected of having a little bit of sympathy for Mussolini? Because that would have been more, um, more of something, a criticism that people could get away with. Yeah, and Thomas Kessner's, I, I think it was in Kessner's book, I'm not sure, I, that was my Bible for, for, uh, for this uh, work. But th you know, there are seven or eight biographies of, uh, of LaGuardia. And I think there is a sense that his, he, his sense of self-righteousness about Hitler did not necessarily translate down to Mussolini. Uh, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously he was not a, a, you know, a fascist sympathizer by any means, but uh, he focused his attention on Hitler, yeah, and, and mostly, uh, frankly, because he understood that Hitler was going to execute exactly what he said in Mein Kampf, right? He was going to try to exterminate the Jews of Europe. Uh, you know, Mussolini was of a different order from right. that, so right. that's why he focused on Hitler. So during the war, he, as you write, LaGuardia develops a sense that he's lapsed into the role of a glorified janitor. Yes, I that's love exactly that. what he says. And, and um, Lehman, w with whom, w whose relationship with LaGuardia we talked about briefly, kind of sponsors him for a cabinet post, right? They yes. talk about Secretary of War, which would have been interesting. Um, Secretary of Labor to succeed Frances Perkins, who was appointed, as most of you know, in this house. I don't think she was going anywhere. No. But so what happened to those cabinet aspirations? If they were so close, why didn't Roosevelt pick him up in a high-level job? Well, that's a good question. Well, first of all, Frances Perkins wasn't going anywhere. And, and I can say this. I was a journalist for 40 years. You know how journalists are, right? Like the rumor was Frances Perkins was going to quit. Oh, 
Oh, she didn't quit, actually. Right. right? Secretary of War at the time was Henry Stinson, who was a Republican. Uh, and he had only been on the job for about four or five months when the rumor mill started that LaGuardia might be the next Secretary of War. And LaGuardia, in the run-up to Pearl Harbor, actually, so, so the compromise was he doesn't get that job, but Franklin <laughs> Roosevelt knows he's got to do something to keep this guy like quiet. So he puts him in charge of civil defense. He also has a co-chair of civil defense, and that's Eleanor Roosevelt. And the two of them did not get along uh, in there. You know, Roosevelt, I mean, rather, LaGuardia liked to run around in a, a hard hat, blowing whistles, saying, all right, let's pretend there's a grenade over there. What do we do, right? And, and Eleanor Roosevelt thought one of the ways that you prepare s for civil defense is that you remind people why the country is worth fighting for. And I know this is going to sound like I'm making fun, but I'm not. One of, her, uh, one of her projects in civil defense was a dance class. Well, you can imagine what Franklin, uh, what Fiorella LaGuardia thought of that, right? And at one point she writes, I quickly realized that my job was to do all of the things Mayor LaGuardia didn't want to do, like dance classes, right? So, so he got that instead of Secretary of War. Which was not enough for him. Which was not enough. But by the way, he was also mayor of New York at the time, too. Yeah. And the, the press criticized him. It was like, one job should be oh, enough Oh, I see. For he kept, he, he was kept in both. the mayoralty. Yes, he kept both, right? I'm interested in this, the thing with Eleanor. So he, they just didn't get along? No. Or just on this, she thought he was too flamboyant? Well, yes, they, yes, and that actually was one of the criticisms, was, okay, you want to make Fiorello LaGuardia this or that, are you going to be able to control him? <laughs> you know? so, uh, but I think that the bad blood between Eleanor and, and LaGuardia was really over the civil defense. I mean, I think they got along famously without, uh, you know, as we know, Eleanor Roosevelt was Franklin's uh, conscience on civil rights, and to an extent, LaGuardia was as well. So they, they, sort, of, uh, they sort of had a common... Uh, position on civil but rights. But stylistically, well. you stylistically, see. Stylistically, they could not have been <laughs> more different. By the way, Eleanor's first job when she left, when her mother-in-law told her she should be more involved with charities, since she didn't seem to love being here all the time, was why. as a dance instructor. Oh, is that right? Yeah, ah. in the Henry Street or Settlement House. Oh, so there you go. This six-foot-tall woman was a dance and yoga instructor. And that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> So his health declines, right? Yes. After World War II, and and does he get cancer right away, or does he have other problems? I, you know, he I, ages quickly. He does age quickly, right? He, so he he surrenders office to Bill O'Dwyer, William O'Dwyer, on, on New Year's Day, 1946. Uh, he goes he goes on a mission for Harry Truman down to South America. That's when he gets the UN job afterwards. Now I would say if you looked at LaGuardia's itinerary, I mean, he was basically the Herbert Hoover of World War II for a while. He was trying to feed and clothe and house all of the refugees of Europe. And you look at that, you, you look at all the traveling he was doing and, the, and the, the great energy that he put into it, I think that job, I think that job wore him down more than the mayoralty. And then I guess, I forget when he's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, but it's probably early 46. And I've read different versions about whether he was actually told the truth or not about his, his uh, diagnosis. But uh, he does go quickly. And you know, his parks commissioner was Robert Moses. I guess, I, can I say his yeah. name in here? <laughs> but uh, Robert Moses is his, his parks commissioner. And an admirer. Right? And an admirer and sometimes not an admirer. But, Robert Moses is not somebody we associate necessarily with empathy, right? And Moses writes a tribute to LaGuardia after LaGuardia's death, which is published. You can get it on eBay. And he says, he visited LaGuardia towards the end, and he said, I came out of that room and I wanted to cry. I'm not sure Robert Moses admitted to wanting to cry too often. So that should tell you, you know, it was, he had a hard death. There's no question yeah. about it. And as, LaGuard as Moses is leaving, I think it was this time, Mos uh, LaGuardia says, the doctor said he'd be back with morphine. I hope he comes soon. Yeah. And by the way, these stories, are you don't have to go online. They're all in the book. Yeah. Just, just oh, right. Yes, there is that. Yeah. So <laughs> he, LaGuardia called um, his autobiography the making of an insurgent. Why does he choose that of all words? Why is that the word that 
he ascribes to himself as preeminent because he saw himself as a troublemaker. He saw himself as an outsider. You know, he was he was not a Republican. He was an insurgent Republican, right? He was not a regular. So, you know, in his world, his word world was very bifurcated, right? There were the regulars and there were the insurgents, the people who were trying to upend the status quo. And that's how he saw himself. Uh, and, and to the point I made about him not wanting to be seen as a politician, in 1941, uh, he is given a, a, a galley of the book called Who's Who in America, right? And he's got an entry in it. And he looks at it, and he's asked to look at it to make sure it's correct. And he sees, you know, LaGuardia, comma, Fiorello, H, politician. He hit the ceiling. He <laughs> called the publisher of Who's Who and said, uh, you cannot print that. You can imagine what the, well, why not, major, mayor? Because I am not a politician. You either put in the words, municipal officer or take out my entry entirely. <laughs> municipal officer. So remember, if anyone ever asks, Fiorel LaGuardia was a municipal officer or an insurgent, but not a politician. That's interesting. Um, as he was in everybody's lives every day, right? I mean, he kind of set the standard for mayors. Mayors are more present than governors, presidents. They're everywhere. They're on television. Did he, was he an incurable ham, or oh did God, he yes. think, or did but did he also think that he needed to inject himself into everything, not just fires and well, smashing he, liquor things before right. prohibition ended? He shared with Teddy Roosevelt, yeah. who I think is an interesting comparison. He shared with Teddy Roosevelt what Alice Roosevelt said about her father, right? That he wanted to be the the corpse at every wake and the bride at every wedding, right? So did Laguardia. You know, he, he wanted to be the chief at every fire, the general invading Italy, right? That's what he, he wanted. He loved being the center of attention. But, um, but I also think that it, there's, there's a series of uh, radio shows. He did have a radio show from 1943, uh, uh, actually almost until the day he died, on WNYC. Uh, and the archives are on the WNYC archives, where he's telling people, that they're wonderful to listen to because you're thinking, my God, what a mayor. At one point, he's he's, it's very sexist language, I know, but he's saying to the housewives of New York City, you know, remember, f uh, food is being rationed during World War II. And he's saying things like, ladies, when you go to the market this week, don't buy white fish. They're, they're ripping you, he didn't say ripping you off, but basically they're charging too much. White fish is go, I checked, white fish is going at the Jefferson market for 50 cents a pound. It should be no more than a quarter. So. You know what you should do, ladies? You should go out and buy mutton this week. <laughs> and the following week on a show, he says, and by the way, these shows, I think, had to be unscripted, right? Uh, which is part of the charm, too. He talks about the fact that, you know, I know I recommended that you not buy whitefish, and it looks like most of you didn't. I want you to know I had my wife prepared mutton this week, and we had it in a hash. But if you make it into a hash, and he describes how to make mutton hash. And I'm thinking, there's no wonder we still remember this guy. I mean, I'm sorry, but could you imagine, fill in the blank, could you imagine Mayor so-and-so delivering that kind of a message? I don't think so. I like the way you described it in the book, that he loved to mind other people's business. Yes, <laughs> he did do <laughs> Which, that. Right? But remained hugely popular, right? Yes, yes. There was no resentment about that, because people felt he was on their side. Right, look, here's the mayor telling me not to, not to buy whitefish. Well, what do I know from whitefish, right? But I uh, better, I'll listen to him. And they took his advice. Because he also, you know, the, the photo ops are great too. I mean, how could you not love a mayor who's coming out of a burning building and, the tr and his, you know, turnout coat is, 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 is wet with, with the, the water from the fire department? I mean, how do you, and he's got the hat on. Like, yeah. how do you not like that guy? Yeah. Um, I want to read a quote that I took from your book. Uh oh. Because I think it's, meaningful. When he was a congressman and he was arguing against the proposed immigration restrictions, um, he lectured members of Congress about the Jewish and Italian immigrant. He said, where will you find him doing the most laborious work from the moment he lands until he is laid away to give his children the opportunity which was denied him and his ancestors for centuries. Yeah. It's a pretty amazing sentiment, yeah. even if it wasn't 
persuasive, right? Well, unfortunately, the National Origins Act passed overwhelmingly in May of 1924. And at one point, too, LaGuardia says about the immigration reforms, he says, we cannot let the spirit of the Ku Klux Klan lead this legislation. So he saw it for what yeah. it was, right? He, and, and we all know, in 1924, in New York City, 100 years ago, at the original Madison Square Garden, I guess it was the original at Madison Square, the Democratic National Convention of 1924, was be, the nomination fight was between Al Smith and William Gibbs McAdoo, who was the endorsed candidate of the Ku Klux Klan. Right here in New York, 100 years ago. The longest right. convention ever, two and a half weeks, 103 ballots. Because Al Smith, with Franklin Roosevelt as his campaign manager, Al Smith said, I will stay here until I, we agree that the Democratic Party, my Democratic Party, is not going to nominate a candidate of the Ku Klux Klan. And he succeeded in blocking McAdoo, and they wound up picking this guy, John Davis, who goes down to defeat uh, Calvin Coolidge. And that's the, that's the convention that marks Franklin Roosevelt's comeback from exactly. polio, because by practicing walking upstairs outside of his library, yep. he, he was able to negotiate the space between the curtain and the podium with his braces, with his crutches, and with his son. Yep. So an important moment. Yes. Um, we have time for some questions. If anyone has a question, raise your hand and someone will come with a microphone. Michael, you, you were first up, so. Thank you. Yes, I'm Michael Myers, Hi. New York Civil Rights Coalition. I have a two-part question. LaGuardia, according to my parents and grandparents, <laughs> was well-liked by blacks despite the history of segregation. So I want to I know, how was that? How, was, how, how could blacks like, like LaGuardia because of the segregated nature of, of New York at the time? And my other part of my question is, um, when you have um, Republicans and Democrats who get elected as office in New York, there used to be Democrats and Republicans got elected. Um, as I remember, Lindsay was a Republican, mm -hmm. <laughs> and as was another United States senator from New York and New Jersey, and you had, and Lindsay was a Republican. Um, so you had several Republicans, um, Giuliani. So my question is, what happened to the Republican Party that they were, have been forsaken since the LaGuardia days, who, was a, who also was a Republican? and well-known and well-regarded. And Republicans now can't get elected since Giuliani. Yeah, well, well, I'll answer the second question first. So the Republican Party in New York is, uh, in New York City, is certainly moribund. I, where my home borough of Staten Island still elects some Republicans, right? Uh, but, you know, the, the odds of having a Republican mayor anytime soon are pretty slim. You know, that, that Giuliani-Bloomberg period of 20 years is an anomaly. You know, I'll put on my historian's hat. That's never happened before. Uh, statewide, a Republican hasn't won since George Pataki's third term in 2002, I think, or 2006, 2006. It was the last time a Republican won statewide. They don't compete in U.S. Senate races anymore. They don't compete for Comptroller. They don't compete for, they just don't compete, right? They're, they seem content to organize locally with some success, right? They, they won four congressional seats in New York in 2022, which tip, helped tip the balance to the Republicans. So, but, but as an organized political party in New York, they're not particularly organized. That's the second part. The first part, LaGuardia was mayor for two riots in Harlem, uh, one in the early 30s and one in 1943. And by most accounts, even his fiercest critic was Adam Clayton Powell Jr. in the 40s. By most accounts, he handled both of those race riots with, uh, decently, but particularly the one in the 40s, it, what, what I think it was 42 or 43, it was during the war, where the rumor was there was an incident at a hotel in Harlem, and the rumor was that a, a black soldier defending his mother had been shot and killed. It wasn't true. There was an incident with a police officer, with the soldier and the mother. They left, and, and it, it, the police officer may or may not have been assaulted. He did discharge his weapon and the soldier was wounded. 
but it became something else. And the anger spilled into the streets. But LaGuardia was prepared for it because other American cities, including Detroit, had had race riots several months before. And he told the NYPD, we have to be prepared. This is going to happen here. He even gives a radio address where he says, actually, presciently, he says, you good people, you New Yorkers, I beg of you, don't listen to rumors. And, of course, and sure enough, that's what happens here, right? LaGuardia goes up to Harlem and spends the night on a flatbed truck go yelling at people, please go home, please go home. John Lindsay, of course, does the same thing in 1967. John Lindsay was walking in Fiorello's footsteps uh, in 1967, 1968. So uh, the Amsterdam News at one point says that uh, blacks have gotten more jobs through the LaGuardia administration than any other administration. Some of them, you know, the biographers say were kind of token appointments, but you know what? It was a high; they were high-profile appointments. Now, the flip side is the flip side is the black community did uh, w was not happy with the fact that LaGuardia went along with MetLife's plan to build the Stuyvesant houses and Peter Cooper Village as segregated, and he was under pressure to tell MetLife, "You can't do this." And at a certain point, LaGuardia fires off a not particularly LaGuardian letter. You know, it's not filled with any sort of invective. It's just sort of saying to MetLife, gee, you really shouldn't be doing this. Yours truly, Fiorella F. LaGuardia. So, so he kind of let down the black community with Stuyvesant Town. But in the, in the two very, you know, two bad incidents in his mayoralty, he won praise even from critics like Adam Clayton Powell Jr. By the way, there's a very powerful painting of that incident from the 1943 riot in the Harlem Renaissance show at the Met. Oh. Just plugging it. Yes, we have one here. W wait for the mic, please. I, I, just um, a historical, perhaps correction, although it may well be in your book. When LaGuardia won in 38, he got almost as, pardon, in 37, he got almost as many votes on the American Labor Party line as he got on the Republican line. He was a fusion candidate. Yes, he was, yes. He was not a traditional Republican in that sense. Absolutely and true. The ALP was significantly to the left of the Democratic Party in New York City. Yes. He also won re-election in 1924. He won re-election to Congress as a socialist, even though he said um, the Republicans had kicked him out because he didn't support Calvin Coolidge. He supported the insurgent, uh, the Progressive Party. And so the Republican Party said, oh, yeah, watch this. And the socialists said, well, your line, uh, you know, our line is yours if you want it. And he won. Uh, but he, of course, he means, I'm not a socialist. But, uh, but he was happy to take the line. And that's how he won. Yeah. Oops, sorry. No, that's fine. I think there's a few hands yeah, in the back, too. To yeah, back. right. Thank you very much. Uh, first, an aside, and then a question. The aside is that clearly it was a good skill set to be able to understand German in the late 30s and early 40s. And FDR was one of our few presidents who actually spoke a second language, and he did understand German. A question, apart from what happened to LaGuardia's young family, when they were living in the tenement buildings, were there any articulated regrets that LaGuardia had that you know about? Well, we might have found out if he had been able to complete, complete his autobiography. He was going to publish it in two volumes. The first volume only takes us to 1919. I think if he had any regrets, it was that. <laughs> Well, that he, a, he didn't finish his book, and second of all, he still couldn't figure out how to land a plane. At one point, when, he, when he's in Italy training Italian pilots, he actually says, look, there's a quote in the book that says, I can't get the buzzard to take off, I can't get the buzzard to land, but once I'm in the air, I can fly him. <laughs> There's someone who you never want to hear the phrase, hi, this is Fiorello, this is your captain speaking. <laughs> Don't want to hear that. Yeah, in the back, right there. Oh, there's some back there, too. How did he inspire uh, Robert Moses in, term, in terms of what he turned out to be vis-a-vis -vis transportation, mass transit? Robert Moses. <laughs> he was his park commissioner. I yeah, guess. he was his parks commissioner. He was his master builder, right? And the, But the relationship is, is somewhat tortured. I mean, Fiorello had to uh, walk a fine line 
between understanding that Moses could get things done, because that was the most important thing, right? Uh, uh, Republicans were constantly criticizing the WPA and other New Deal projects as a bunch of guys standing on, sitting on shovels, you know, standing up and leaning on shovels. LaGuardia wanted to show that work was getting done, and Moses, Moses got work done. But by the same token, uh, at a certain point, Moses realized that there was money to be made in public housing which for the first time he realized that there was a need for public housing. So at a point, uh, he tries to do an end run around LaGuardia by telling people in the press he's going to give a speech uptown where he's going to announce a new housing authority that will take over the New York City Housing Authority and will start getting money from the state and federal government. LaGuardia, he's going to give the speech on WNYC. LaGuardia, LaGuardia hears about it, and WNYC was owned by the city of New York. He told the head of WNYC, you've got some engineers working Moses' speech, right? Tell them to cut the cord. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and Moses gives a speech, and you can there's a picture of it, right? WNYC thing right in front of it. Nobody heard the speech, right? <laughs> so that gives you an idea. It was, a, it was a tortured relationship between Moses and LaGuardia. In fact, when LaGuardia wrote this tribute to, uh, I'm sorry, when Moses wrote a tribute to LaGuardia that I quoted before, he starts out by saying, I've been asked to write a tribute to Fiorel LaGuardia. I'm not sure why. <laughs> yeah, so, because Moses has the reputation of sidelining like the subway system in favor of uh, highways and cars, yeah. right? Was that inspired by LaGuardia? I don't think so. No, what, what was LaGuardia's idea of mass transit? Well, I think, I think we would have seen Fiorello on the subway. Well, he, 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 in fact, one of his accomplishments was he sort of unified the, uh, the subway system and built the I, what we older New Yorkers call the I&D line. Right. right? That, that was a LaGuardia project. Um, Trudy, did you have a question? A microphone? Um, yeah, hi. Just, uh, First of all, I want to thank you for giving a new term for p people using politician as a derogatory. And I never knew that. He called a municipal officer, I think, is a great, great term. But what I want to ask you about is, given his feelings about New Jersey, um, how do you think he would feel about New Jersey now trying to block congestion pricing and how do you think he would feel about congestion pricing in general? Yeah, I honestly Trying don't to know. save yeah. New York. Yeah, I mean, he was a New York nationalist, so I don't think he would particularly like uh, New Jersey, but of course some of the New York suburbs are not so keen on the congestion pricing either. I don't think it's very popular in Nassau County. But uh, we had a question back there too, if we could get that one in. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, what, what was good for New York City was good for him. I, I, it's, it's hard to specul that, uh, speculate. He would have never heard of congestion pricing because, you know. Okay, we, we, I think you answered it. Yeah. Anyone? Who's, who's we have somebody there? way in the back that only I can see. Okay, but the person will uh, have to okay. step forward yes. because we have sound problems under that. Oh, balcony. I see. Okay. Thank you. This is great. Uh, just real quick, what would it be like to meet LaGuardia at a cocktail party? Would he talk <laughs> about himself? Would he ask <laughs> us questions? And did like even indulge that much? You know? Well, thank you, you know, by the way, it's awesome. Yeah, he. Thank you. Uh, he was a bit of a wine drinker himself, uh, and and by the way, you know, was a big critic of prohibition. I think he would be delightful. I wish I could have met Fiorello LaGuardia. Right? I, 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 he's the personality who would take over a room. I'm sure he would tell you stories about the time he got drunk with the King of Italy while he was in service, and at the end of the night, he was calling the King King Emmanuel. He was calling the King Manny. <laughs> What does that tell you about what kind of character he was? Okay, yeah. Two, two more, two more, Will. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for a very fine presentation. Thanks. Uh, given that LaGuardia was, uh, in, your, in your estimation, was a law and order mayor? Yes, I would say he what, was. What do you think he would have said about the bail laws of today? How would he react bail, to that? The bail reform laws. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, again, I, I, that, that would be one that Thomas Kessner would be better off answering. I, you know, I don't know. I do know, but to your point, LaGuardia was both a police reformer and a law and order man, right? His first speech as mayor was down at police headquarters where he went and said to the police officers, if you got your job because you know a Tammany hack, quit now. If you think you're going to be able to continue to take graft, quit now. If you th go on and on, right? He put the police on notice that he was watching them.
But by the same token, he also says, and this is in the book, this is not a politically correct statement, but he said, you know, if, a bun if, if cops beat up a bunch of gangsters and do some damage, that's okay with me, right? So, right? Yeah, sorry. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Michelle Winfield. I Hi. wanted to know, since you talked about Stuyvesant uh, being white only, I wanted to know, since Mayor LaGuardia had Robert Moses as his parks commissioner, he teamed up with MetLife to say whites and blacks can't mix. What is your perspective on why he would be in direct opposition to the mayor on that? Well, first of all, I mean, you're right. I mean, there's, there's, there's a conflict there, right? LaGuardia was, for his time, a liberal on civil rights. When, uh, I, I'm forgetting his name, but when Chicago elected an African-American mayor to Congress in 1928, the first African-American member of Congress, I think, of the 20th century, several Republicans and Democrats told the Speaker of the House, who I think was Joe Cannon, uh, don't put his office anywhere near mine. And LaGuardia stepped forward and said, put him next to me, right? And again, the Amsterdam News praised his record on civil rights. How do you, how do you square that with LaGuardia basically giving tacit approval to a segregated Stuyvesant town, Peter Cooper Village? I, I can't, I, I don't know. It's a contradiction. And as we've discovered, you know, all of our heroes have contradictions. Maybe we shouldn't have heroes, I don't know. But I, I can't square that circle. Well, you have really brought LaGuardia back to life for us tonight, and we thank you, Terry. Thank you. So please join us upstairs for a reception.